the message tonight, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be back in church. Pray that you bless your people, Lord. I pray, Lord, I just lift everybody up before you tonight. All the requests that we'll be praying about later uh, for those that uh, that really need prayer tonight. Just uh, encourage them, help them, Lord. And thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, ben, preaching a lot on prayer and taking time out of your busy life to, to give it to the Lord. And I tell you one message, and it was uh, something I didn't even have prepared, but as I was preaching, it came out and I was able to preach some of that up at Pastor Mike's as well. The whole idea of, could you not watch with me for one hour? And I think that's really, uh, it's been a blessing to you. Uh, I've had so much feedback over that where some have said, Pastor, it, it really, it really affected me, uh, one hour with the Lord. And since then, I've had many of you come up and say, Pastor, I did it. I'd be like, did what? I, I spent one hour in prayer with the Lord. Uh, and I tell you what, if you do it, you're much better off afterwards. So if you haven't ever spent one time, one hour of time alone with the Lord, as he said to the disciples there in the garden, could you not watch with me for one hour? And he challenged them. And you have to think, we read our Bible so much that the questions that the Lord asked people here on earth, you have to think that possibly he put those in there to prepare us for the judgment. Think about it. Isn't God's word something that prepares us for judgment to come? Well, think about the questions that the Lord asked. And if he turns around and says, I asked my disciples these questions, they were my followers. You are my disciple. And he might at the judgment say, could you not have watched with me for one hour? Could you not have read my word all the way through? Could you not have been one of my witnesses? Uh, you know, and, and again, I could take some questions that he asked and specifically put those on us. But the whole word of God, all the Bible, is something that we need to take into account and think of. Let's be practical. And in practical life and practical living, our time alone with God is going to be very, very important to the life we live here. And tonight's message is not about really challenging you to spend the time alone with the Lord, but I'm going to talk about what happens when you do. What happens when you do? I think I've challenged you enough over the past couple of weeks to say, hey, believe in prayer. And when you pray, pray believing and pray with an expectation. And somebody the other day, they were, they were saying they think that the Lord's getting upset with them for, for their persistence, that they're becoming a pain in the butt to the Lord. And I said, I've never heard anybody ever say that to me or think that, but somebody did say that to me. And I said, I don't think that's the way it works, that God says it's too much. I can't stand it anymore. Didn't he tell you to pray that way? Now, if God, if God, on the other hand, says, stop it and don't ask again, and you get that impression, did God ever do that? He did that with Moses. Didn't Moses pester him? And said, Lord, please, let me go into the promised land, please. And the Lord said, no. Because of what you did, how you tempted me. And at the waters of strife, he, you're not going in. So he wouldn't let Moses go into the promised land. And he told him, no, emphatically, no. Paul, another example, <clears throat> Paul besought the Lord thrice. And finally, the Lord said to him, no, no. And basically, don't ask again. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, my, <clears throat> my, uh, <clears throat> my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul understood. So sometimes in life, there are things that happen <clears throat> that may stick with us. Infirmities, for instance, sometimes those may stick with us till the day that we die. Sometimes the Lord may take them away. 
but there are times it's going to stick with you and the Lord's doing it because he wants that to be in your life. And I can honestly attest to that. I, I understand I'm never going to get better from my thyroid disease. I understand there are certain things in my life with my hip. I was never going to get better with my hip until they had to replace it. It was something that was going to have my whole life. I did pray about it. And I, I, I'd say to the Lord, and I know you might do it too. Lord, all you have to do is think it. You could take this thing away from me. And all you have to do is just think it. There's nothing he can't do, right? All he'd have to do is just either think it or touch it, and it would be healed. But that wasn't to be for me. And when you understand that, you begin to pray this way. Not, Lord, please heal me, but Lord, please help me to be able to bear this. And Lord, help me through this to understand Help me through this infirmity to not quit and to gain strength through the infirmity. Because all of us are going to have something. And if you're faithful to God, the devil just might pop up and say, Lord, they're without infirmity. <laughs> you know, but what the Lord wants, the Lord wants us to fully surrender to his will. He wants us to do that. I was listening to my Bible today looking for key things. Uh, I found Dr. Ruckman's Bible reading to be very encouraging to me. The way he reads, the pace that he reads, the emphasis he puts on certain things. And because I know him personally, knew him personally, it just... I can get what he's trying to put through because I know him as a person. And there are certain things that stand out. Like one verse today, let us not be weary in well-doing. Sometimes we can get overloaded even when doing the right thing. And sometimes we get worn out. Let us not be weary in well-doing. God desires, and again, this is something I'll never understand. We are so insignificant in the sight of God. When you think about him and think about us, why does he crave our attention? And why does God want us to always talk to him? What do we do for him when we talk to him? What does that do for him? Now, when he talks to us, that does a lot for us. But what can we really offer God that he would want us to talk to him? And therein is what makes God so unbelievable and so awesome. Because God could have respect unto us lowly human beings. And all God wants is us to spend time with him. And here's the thing tonight with tonight's message. When we get alone with the Lord and we spend time with him, spiritually, we get uplifted. Emotionally, we get help. God helps us take care of the cares of our own life. But can it help us physically? Yes, and when you study the scripture, Moses, when he got alone with God, physical changes occurred. And this is where that, that time in prayer, that can you not watch with me for one hour, when we get alone with God for any extended amount of time, his holiness begins to radiate in us and his holiness begins to show through us. Did you ever meet somebody that you just knew had spent time alone with God? Did you ever just meet someone where you just know <laughs> You met them and you said, there is something holy about that person. There is something unique about that person. And I've told you many times, and it happens to me on elevators quite a bit. 
elevator will open and there'll be a person standing there and I'll walk in and they look at me and I look at them and I turn for a second. Then I'll turn again and look at them. And I'll say, are you a preacher? And the person will be like, yes. How did you know that? I just knew it. There was something in them I could see, something in their face, something in their eyes that shined through that you could see Christ in them. Have you ever met someone like that? And, of course, my friends, and I, I always say this because it's funny to me. My dad had very light blue eyes, and they were they were just brilliant. And my sisters and I used to always say, man, why couldn't we have got dad's eyes? I mean, they were like the color of his shirt, even bluer. But my friend would say, I, I can't know. When I talk to your dad, it just, there's something. When he stares at me and looks at me, it's like, it's like I'm looking at God. And I start laughing and then say, but how come I don't feel that when I'm talking to you? You know, and of course we all laugh about that, but there is something unique about a holy individual and about someone that spends time with the Lord, others will begin to see in you your time you spent with God. Has somebody ever come up to you and said, there's something about you, what is it? Or they've commented on you? Maybe a child growing up? People say, that child, there's something holy about them. There's something unique about them. Let's go and look at Matthew chapter 17. Now, of course, Christ would have had that look, right? Wasn't he God in the flesh? Imagine how close Judas Iscariot got to him when he betrayed him with a kiss. This close to his face. Friend. You know, the Lord looked at him. Imagine looking into those eyes. Matthew chapter 17, Matthew 17. And let's look in verse number one. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And look, his face, his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. Holiness. He was transfigured into his glory and his face shone. And we know from the book of Revelation and from other parts of the Bible that the Lord has said, you can't see, no man can see me and live. Because Moses told him, he said, Lord, let me see your glory. And the Lord said, no man can see me and live. So when you think about holiness, holiness can be very terrible, terribly majestic, and terrible in a sense of so kind of awe-inspiring that it's scary. And to feel the presence of God this way, and he said to Moses, he said, Nobody can see my face and live. But he showed him his hinder parts, didn't he? And he saw the glory of God. But yet in the book, and you read your Old Testament, whenever they saw the appearance of God, what happened to the person who saw it? Many times they fell down as if they were a dead man. How about the angels that appeared at the tomb? The soldiers that were there became as what? Dead men. Because of the holiness of those angels, because of just how they look and how each angelic appearance in the scripture caused a person to be in fear. Even Zacharias, the priest, when he was doing his ministry there, he turned and he saw the angel Gabriel. And what was his feeling? His feeling was fear, wasn't it? Why, it wasn't an evil person. It was a holy individual a holy being, but fear came upon him. Now imagine if a person could get that way with an angel, what would happen if he saw God? And take the book of Revelation, chapter one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
That's how it starts. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony that he held. And then all of a sudden he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice. And he turned to see the voice that spake to him. And being turned, he saw God. And he fell at his feet as dead. And the Bible says there that he laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. But I'm alive evermore. And John said, his voice was as a sound of many waters and his, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burn in a furnace. Imagine the holiness of God. Aren't you glad he keeps himself behind the scenes? <laughs> because if he would appear tonight to us, what would happen? We can't take it in. We can't take it in. But in, in and through prayer and a relationship with God and a constant communication with God, something begins to happen to us. And I tell you what happens. God's holiness begins to rub off on us. And as his holiness rubs off on us, it changes even our countenance. And that's why someone who spends time in prayer, and we would all be better if we spent time in prayer. Mark that down. We would all be better if we spent time in prayer. If you began your day with prayer, if you had prayer in the middle of the day, and if you ended your day with prayer, you would be better for it. Your marriage would be better for it. Your children would be better for it. Your husband, your wife, whoever you are, or whatever situation you're in, you'd be better for it. Because the holiness of God, after a while, the holiness of God will rub off on you. And it's going to do something to you. It's going to cause your face to shine. Can we see that in the scripture? Jesus' face shown here, didn't it? Who else's face shown? Now we could say, well, Moses. Yeah, we already said that. But there's another guy in the Bible who got alone with God and got full of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit caused his face to shine as that of an angel. And the guys around him didn't like it. And the council looked at him and saw his face as the face of an angel. It's Stephen. It's Stephen. Come on, Tommy. Come on, Tommy. Tommy had a great message on Sunday. He really did. I talked to my brother-in-law, Kevin, and he says, man, Tommy's message was really good. And he said, what are you going to do with all your free Sundays moving forward? <laughs> I said, amen. He did. He had a great Sunday school. And I'm telling you, if you listen to his Sunday school, it will save you a lot of time studying. Because he did all the work. That's what I said to him. I said, you did all the work and I get all the fruit. I don't have to go. He stayed up all night on Saturday. Didn't sleep a wink preparing for Sunday school. And I tell you what, I sat there and I got such a blessing out of it because it's something I always wanted to do, but I never had the time to do it. So thank you for going without sleep. I got all the blessing out of it. Let's go over to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6. Acts 6. Acts chapter 6. I, I pointed out Tommy because this is his favorite character in the Bible. Acts 6, and let's look in verse number 10. Look in verse 8. Acts 6, 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue. You're always going to have hindrances. Of course, that's the way it is. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia, 
and of Asia disputing with Stephen. These were probably the top dogs as far as intellect and all that kind of uh, wisdom and knowledge they disputed with Stephen. Look, but no matter how wise or how knowledgeable a person is or puffed up with wisdom they are, when the Holy Ghost is in you, they can't stop what's in you. Verse 10, and they were not able to resist. Why weren't they? There were a bunch of them, right? And one of him. That's why don't worry when you get in a situation where somebody challenges you and what you believe. What does God say in that day? The Holy Ghost will give you the words to say. He'll give you it. That's why if you stand up for what you believe, don't worry about the results. God will give you what you need to say. He just wants you to stand and open your mouth. That's the hardest thing. It's that initial, ah, it's like the words won't come out. I've been there. And it's like, and it just won't come. And it's like, you want it to so badly. It's just like, let me get one word out. And if you can get one word out, then from there, the Holy Spirit kicks in and takes over because you put your faith in him to act for you. And that's exactly what he did for Stephen. Stephen stood up. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses. Now, if you didn't know where I was reading, you'd almost seem, uh, you'd almost think that this was who? Christ. And this is how it works. The devil will do this. This is his way of trying to uh, stop the gospel and stop the preaching. He'll do whatever he can do. 13, and set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. But look in 15. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. <laughs> all of them looking at him saying, man, this guy, his face is really shining. Now, who does that remind you of? That's got to take you back to Moses. Now, why were these guys' faces shining? Well, Christ, of course, his face shined because he's God. He's transfigured. His face shines. But Stephen, he's not God. Stephen was a deacon. Dave, Donnie, deacon. Could their faces shine? Absolutely. Hey, Dave, what happened to your face? <laughs> Why, Kathy, get some new goat's milk soap or something like that? What happened? Man, are you shining? And I remember years ago, we had a revival meeting, and Dave Spratley got a good dose of the Holy Spirit during that meeting. And I'm telling you, Dave just got it. It was like he got transfigured. He was just unbelievably happy. I mean, laughing, happy, just couldn't stop. And it was, everybody was, had a good dose of the Holy Spirit. I mean, after 18 days of preaching, things begin to happen. And it was great. And I felt the Holy Spirit moving. And you could see it in people. The Holy Spirit coming out of people, filling them. That's biblical, folks. That's what we should all want. And this is where when you pray, when you read, when you get alone with God, the Bible says, and be what? Filled with the Spirit. And this cup right here is three quarters full of water. But didn't David say, my cup runneth over? And when it runs over, guess what? It affects things around it, doesn't it? If this cup began to run over with water, it would wet the whole rug, wouldn't it? And if I held it over Cokie... <laughs> If I held it over Koki and it began to run over, what would it do to him? It'd make him wet, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have effect on him? 
It would. So when the Holy Spirit is overflowing in you, where's it going? Where's it going? Out. Out. And who's it affecting? People around you. Think of this. When somebody is negative, 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 all the time. Anybody ever know anybody like that? You work with one of them? Negative Nelly. All the time. Debbie Downer. I've heard it said the male part is Donnie Downer. Not nothing against Donnie. Downer. But you always get somebody. What happens? You're excited. The team's happy. And you get this person. And they just like an anchor. Just pull the whole team down. And you say, what happened? Negativism. This pessimist, or this pessimist, they're so contagious. Isn't it the same way with someone who's optimistic? Someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit? All of a sudden, everybody around them gets excited. What they say of laughter? <laughs> you start, I start up here laughing. I, I, I'll never forget. I don't know where I saw it. I look for it all the time. I even told Nadine because Nadine and I, we to laugh. Nadine and I would watch the Three Stooges. We we are we like the Three Stooges, and we'd start laughing at Three Stooges, and I just it just would make both of us laugh. But I told her, I said, Nadine, when I was younger, there was something that came on TV. There was a laughing festival in Japan, and I never found it since. But I remember seeing it. This guy got up and he was a Japanese guy and he had the microphone and there were hundreds of people and he just started laughing, laughing hysterically. I was laughing so hard I couldn't get off the floor. He didn't tell a joke. He never said a word. He just laughed. And everybody in that crowd was roaring with laughter. What happened? That's what God wants to do with us. The preaching comes from the pulpit. The Holy Spirit begins to move, and it gets in your hearts and makes you glad. So therefore, when you go out, you're bubbly and happy and glad. That's what church should do for you. That's what the singing should do for you. That's what you should get when you come to church. You should get your cup full. Full. Now, I know you say, well, Pastor, I don't always feel that way. Listen, Wednesdays are tough because you're tired. You've worked all day. Some of you have maybe not slept well. Some maybe are not feeling well. You come out, you're tired. But that doesn't mean you can't have joy inside still. Yeah, I'm tired, but I'm happy. Tired, but I'm peaceful. Tired, but I'm excited in the Lord. Tired, but I'm going for God. What drives us? The Holy Spirit. Just like it drove him. And when they saw him, no matter what they did to him, they could not quench that spirit. So they killed him. That's how it ends. Next chapter, he starts preaching and the Holy Spirit starts moving. And this time they take rocks and the Lord lets it happen, and they stone him to death. But before he takes his last breath, what does God do for him? I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And having said this, he fell asleep. He gave up the ghost straight to heaven straight to heaven I think he got up there and said Lord why would you let that happen eh. he went out rejoicing didn't he he went out rejoicing and all those you read the book of Acts and you'll see how they were persecuted in Acts and every time they were they were happy and they were glad that they were able to take it for the Lord and suffer for his namesake
Okay, let's go to let's go to X or let's go to Second Corinthians chapter three. This is what happens when somebody gets alone with God. Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three, and let's look in verse thirteen. Second Corinthians been talking about this water. I'm gonna have a drink. Second Corinthians chapter three, and look in verse number thirteen. It says, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So that explains why Jews can't get the prophecies in the Old Testament, because every time they read the Old Testament, it's like they're looking through a veil and they can't decipher the Old Testament. And when they read the scriptures in the Old Testament, they can't understand that that's Christ. And that veil that was put over Moses' face was put over there. And the Lord said, just like that veil was on his face, that veil still remains on the Jews to this day in the reading of the Old Testament. They can't get it. But why did they put the veil? over Moses' face. Why did they? Did he ask them to? They chose to. They said, Moses, when you're talking to us, you got to put this veil over your face. We can't handle it. We can't handle what you look like. Your face is too shiny. It's too brilliant. We can't look at it. Imagine somebody like that with God shining through them couldn't see the, his face cover it. That's how brilliant the face of Moses was. Now, how did Moses get that face? And when did he get it? When did he get it? You remember when he broke all those commandments? What did the Lord tell him the second time? He said, I remember you you broke those commandments. Now, Moses, I want you to, I want you, I'm not doing it this time. I want you to hew out two stones and I want you to carry them all the way up here. You carry those rocks. They're probably pretty heavy too. I said all the way up. And when you get up there, I'll write my laws down. Second time Moses goes up there, the Lord shines through his face. Okay, let's take a look. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. Now, if it was the first time, what chapter would I have gone to? I'd have gone to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. But the second time, Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, you the two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will, uh, Exodus 34, verse 1. I like what the Lord says here. Again, the Lord has a sense of humor. And the Lord said unto Moses, verse 1, You the two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. <laughs> so, Moses, now you're doing the work. You broke them. Now you do it. And be ready in the morning. And come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. Okay. How Can people enter into the throne room of God with you when you pray? You can be praying with a group of people, but individually... You go in. And sometimes the Lord lets some people come in and he keeps others out. Just like here, he said, Moses, you come in. And all the others, they can go apart, but you, I want you to come all the way up. Think of the disciples. The apostles were some closer to the heart of God than others. And who really got in? Let's take... Judas Iscariot? No. Andrew? 
Didn't the Lord love him? Bartholomew? Wasn't he one of the called? But when I say the name Simon Peter, oh, you begin to think what? He got in just a little further, didn't he? And I say James, oh, he got in. But if I say John, you go, oh, he really got in. Wasn't it John who had his ear on the chest of Christ? Imagine. Dum, dum. Dum, dum. Dum, dum. Dum, dum. I hear the heartbeat of the Son of God. Which is why all the disciples says, Lord, who is it? Or they all said, Lord, is it I? I'm sorry, I got that wrong. All the disciples said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And John says, who is it? Right there. It's not me. It's not me. Who is it? Some got in. Some didn't quite get in. Some Christians get closer to the heart of God. Don't you want to be one of them? Moses went all the way up, verse 4, and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Amen. Amen. Keeping mercy. Amen. For thousands. Forgiving iniquity. Amen. It's getting better and better, isn't it? Uh, forgive. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Amen. Aren't you glad you're reading? Forgiving iniquity and transgression, and sin. Only God can do that. And that will by no means clear the guilty. Oh, now that makes us step back and say, oh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a-whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. You think the Lord hates idolatry? Should say so. Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. The feast of unleavened bread shalt thou keep. Seven days thou shalt Eat unleavened bread as I commanded thee in the time of the month Abib. For in the month Abib thou camest out from Egypt. All that openeth the matrix is mine, and every firstling among the cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. But the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. That's interesting. That's an interesting verse. There is a whole lot of stuff in that verse. 
but the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. What's a sinner likened to in the Bible? Huh? An ass is colt. And if the ass's colt is not redeemed with a lamb, what happens to the ass's colt? The ass is not redeemed with a lamb. The first link, it dies. And it dies by what? It's neck breaking. What's the correlation? Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot is found in that verse right there. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. Six days thou shalt work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. In earing time and in harvest thou shalt rest, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits, a wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. Now watch. For I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left until the morning. Unto the morning. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. That's a tithe. Right there. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words. For after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there. Now watch. He was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Now don't you think something would happen to a man to be in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights? Okay, he was there. Now watch. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. Can a person go that long? How long can a person go without water? You go three, four days without water and you're starting to be borderline. It's dangerous. 40 days without food. And 40 days without water, it just goes to show you that holiness can and will sustain you. Now, here's the next thing. Prayer is great. But how much do we fast? How much do we say, Lord, I'm going to go without today? You want prayers answered? You want to shine with the holiness of God? Take the example of Moses. When Moses was in the presence of God, as Job said, Job desired God's word. Come on. More than his necessary food. More than my necessary food. Do we desire the presence of God more than anything. And what happens when we get in the presence of God? What happened to Moses? It says, neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So he just got the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the Mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And when Aaron <laughs> and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, they were afraid to come nigh him. <laughs> I told you holiness can be scary. They were afraid to come near. When they saw him, he's probably walking and his head looked like a light bulb. And they probably looked at him and he had no idea. And they were probably like, and he's like, whoa, what's wrong? Holiness caused his face to shine. They were afraid to come nigh. He was in the presence of God. That's why his face shone. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. 
And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in the Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out, spake unto the children of Israel, that which he commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. You see, the holiness of God can rub off on us. And just like Moses' face shone, Stephen's face shone. And that's the holiness of God coming through. When you get alone with God, that's what begins to happen. That should be our desire. Get alone with God. Okay, we're going to go to prayer.